Welcome back, Fort McMurray. We are coming to you from McDonald Island Park at Shell Place in Fort McMurray for their rock concert that Shaw is happy to bring a community that is trying to rebuild. This community has seen a lot. They survived a fire that they called the beast, and over 25% of this community is now gone. Now the residents are returning, and they are preparing to rebuild. Over this next hour, we are going to tell you stories of complete resilience. We have exclusive interviews, and we have the opportunity to show you the people that are trying to rebuild. We start off our program with Doug Roxburgh, who sat down with Mayor Melissa Blake, who's not only a leader in this community, but she's also a mother, and she shows us how strong this community is. Mayor Blake. How are you holding up so far? So far, so good, I think, for our, our community here in Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo. How is the city holding up? You know what? We came out virtually unscathed from this, this massive beast that ripped through our community. And when you look at the municipal infrastructure, uh, the incredible efforts through the fighting efforts to keep those assets intact paid off with big dividends. Let's go back to May 3rd. Did you think the wildfire was going to destroy Fort McMurray? At the start of May 3rd, I had no, no anticipation that a single home would be harmed. And when we went through the day, the ominous effects start to overshadow the city. And as I watch through the boardroom windows that we have here, I cannot at the end of this day say I didn't believe lives weren't lost as well. I took a, an evacuation route north and had nothing but media portrayals of what had happened and they were pretty daunting even for the first 24 hours. I was thinking that we had lost significantly more than what actually turned out to be the end result. And you were one of the 90,000 that evacuated. Can you tell us your story a little bit? Um, well, after I finally departed City Hall at about 5 o'clock that afternoon watching the fire come down Abbasand Hill, we uh, managed to get together at the family home in Timberley. It took a while to get there, but by, I believe it was 537, I convinced them to leave the house and start the trek. Uh, we ended up going north. There wasn't an option at the time, and what I will tell you from that several hour experience is that I started seeing firsthand the incredible uh, tenacity of the people of our city and, and their patience and perseverance and just it was incredible to see uh, the evolution as we were going through it. Uh, the ability for people to, to find their way to safety without anger or hostility I think was pretty incredibly impressive. In the days that followed, you were receiving numerous reports of the firefighters fighting at certain areas, Birchwood Trails, for example, the water treatment plant. Just going back to my earlier question of, do you think Fort McMurray was about to be wiped out on May 3rd? What about in the days following? I'll tell you, on Sunday, May 14th, we had a meeting about uh, the reentry potential and procedure and what it would look like in the timeline with the Premier and Minister of Municipal Affairs, a number of provincial staff. We had councillors in the room. We had administration from the municipality in the room working on what that would look like. And all of a sudden, I got called by one of my staff members to come and see what they had. And what they showed me was a map about where the fire was at that point in the afternoon. And I immediately took my giant size map to the Premier and said, Madam Premier, we can't even talk about what we're talking about right now. We have got this many risks happening around the city, that many people that are in the north, and the same evacuation potential um, yet again because I know the industry had gone back to work at that point. That to me was probably even more frightening because I was distant from it. So when you're in crisis, it's easier to see your way through it. When you're away from it, all you want to do is make the pieces move and it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And you sit there feeling as helpless as you could possibly be. How helpless did you feel? Because there was a lot of delegation. The province took over. Uh, the regional emergency system took over. It wasn't about that. It was just about the path of the fire. And when nobody can control that, when it's only nature and, and sheer willpower, people's prayer, whatever it took to, to change the outcome that day, we had lost the Black Sands camp at that point, and I know that there are others in close proximity, and I know about the, the, the incredible um, necessity of those assets to our region and our ability to be employed and to be able to have a life post fire and it was just it was even more moving to me. Those people still have a ways to go don't they? 
there's a very long road to recovery for everyone. And, you know, I have the, the, the heartbreaking sympathy for anybody who's lost their possessions, if they were renters, the property, if they were owners, the, the significant um, expense of just trying to stay flush until you can get back into your home. Um, but every single person who was here that day had lived through something they could never have anticipated in a lifetime. And I think we all have a lot of recovering that we're going to have to do through this. You care about these citizens, don't you? Very much. Yeah. You should. You're, you, <laughs> you represent them at a huge yep. level. Yeah. Um, Mayor, the first responders, they played an important role. I owe them everything. And when I think about, what, again, what we experienced on that day and the incredible power and perseverance that they put into doing their work. It's, they're, they're heroes, there's just no question about it. Um, but when you look at what did it take to, to supply them with the capability of doing that, there's a leadership in this, this thing we call the Regional Emergency Operations Center, or REOC. We have, we have to thank Darby Allen for his calm and, and his ability to help through that. Um, but what comes out of the end of a hose, it's water. And so the people that were called water warriors, they've been incredible in terms of, again, preserving those critical assets for municipal services, but just keeping the water flowing. And without, without that part, Partnership. I think um, things could have gone very differently, but I have nothing but a huge debt of gratitude that I owe every person who stayed behind to help us through that terrible day. All throughout this special, we'll be taking you on a tour all throughout Fort McMurray to show you many of the different areas. Right now, we're in Thickwood at Birchwood Trails. Now, this area was saved thanks to some quick thinking by the local fire department. The Birchwood Trails, beautiful, breathtaking, and exquisite. Yet if the Fort McMurray wildfire reached these trails back in early May, it could have meant the end of Timberley and Thickwood. It was an act of heroism which protected these trails. You know, Birchwood Trails, is a main priority for us and we were getting beat all over town um, the first day we're getting beat all over town but we will not lose birchwood trails had the wildfire reached the trails 60 percent of the city would have been lost it would have been devastating sources within the rmwb had already assumed it was about to happen and were bracing for the unthinkable the risk of of, of birchwood going up I don't know what the number would be for loss. Um, it just wasn't an option. We just could not lose Birchwood Trails. So the firefighters fought the fire for two straight days. And with the fire just about to break the entry point to the trails, the fire department had to coordinate a plan with the aerial water bombers. But the pilots couldn't see a target. So a little piece of fabric ended up being the hero. The, the pilots in the, on the airplanes, they, they needed a target. Um, to, to drop on and the guys took their helmets off their head and they and they're, they're you know they're yellow and they, they threw it in into the trees uh, the tankers made another pass still didn't see it um, so then I just threw that that you know I just threw the order out there you need to create a target for these guys through their own initiative, um, they come up and yeah, there was a, uh, a blanket that we hold in all the, all the, the trucks and they, they, they put it in there about 300 yards, they splayed it out and, um, and fortunate enough, the third pass on the tanker group. Of course, that was going to be their last pass because they were running low on fuel. So this was it, this was do or die. And uh, they, uh, the guys made a target large enough that they didn't miss and the tanker drops started happening. Boof, boof, boof. And uh, saved Birchwood Trails that day. Call it motivation or innovation, a battle was won at the Birchwood Trails by the Fort McMurray Fire Department. Unfortunately, the beast destroyed the red tarp, but it will be a symbol for this city for many years to come. The Birchwood Trails was our, our trophy. Uh, the Birchwood Trails was our... Um, motivation that uh, we hadn't lost our Birchwood trails. 
We're continuing on our tour here in Fort McMurray. I now have the opportunity to be joined by Craig Momney. He's one of our reporters. Now, this area right here, it's Caldwood Buffalo, but what's the street that we're on right now? This is actually J.W. Mann Drive. Okay, and then the unbelievable thing happening here is, if you take a look over here, is if you look at the amount of devastation, you got the forest behind, you have the devastation here. I know in a moment we're gonna be talking about a family that you had an opportunity to speak to, yep. that had their house <clears throat> saved, imagine it, in this area. But I want to go back. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that we have two reporters that live up here in Fort McMurray. And you not only were reporting on this, but you went through it yourself. Oh, we were right in the thick of it. Walk me back to May 3rd. Everything's starting to happen. Your community's changing. Do you remember yourself what you were doing and how this all started to come to be in your day? Well, I remember the right off the bat, Doug and I were up in Abbasand because we were shooting his links that day. And we, were, we thought the best shot would have been over the Athabasca and you can literally see this fire coming over the mountain. And at that point, Doug and I got the call where they're like, get out of there, you gotta, you gotta go. So that's what we did. We hopped in our car and we took off downtown. Now, you know, you think about it, and as a reporter, you always want to keep the story going and you want to keep people safe and you want to connect to your community, which you yeah. live in, and tell them what's going on so they know how to plan and what to do when this was happening. But on the flip side, you're a father. Yep. and you have a family here. Yep. So walk me through exactly what happened. So that day, you get in your car, you're driving off. How did you connect with your wife? How did you connect with your daughter? And how did you say, keep your composure? It was one of those, Doug, this, here's the keys to the shot car. I'm out of here, I gotta go. At that point, we were outside of the hospital. I got out of the car right there and ran to Dr. Clark. That's where she was. She's an educational assistant there as well as Annabelle, that's where her school is. And we were trying to get every single kid out of that school at that time. We couldn't leave until that last child was gone. So we didn't get out of there for maybe another hour. And at that time, the streets were already full. So we were backed up downtown for about three hours as we watched Abbasand literally burning down. Okay, so I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and imagine what you're going through. You have your little one in the back seat and you're trying to keep calm, how did you keep your composure through all this process? I just know I had to be the strong one in the car. I know I had the five-year-old in the back, and as she keeps looking out that window, she's seen the flames hitting over top of the, the roof. And next to me, I got my fiance, and she's frantic at the same time, trying to keep her composure at the, at the same time. So I'm the one that had to be the strong one. I had to try to keep everything calm in that vehicle. Where'd you go? We ended up going to uh, Athabasca. We ended up having a friend of the family uh, pick us up in Taganova, and we drove south right back through the flames uh, in downtown. Come back here, you got a job to do. <laughs> you know, you're trying to tell everyone how they can remain safe and how they can come back to the community, but you have your own home. So yep. what's this process been like? It's been, uh, it's been grueling. <laughs> I tell you, by myself up here for the last uh, month and a half, or well, month, uh, just cleaning, doing all the basics. So we were we were actually fortunate. We we did have a home to come back to. We uh, I just obviously did the the normal cleaning, ready for them to come back on uh, June thirtieth. So. Yeah. And how's your little one now? I know she's gone away to spend yep. time with some family. Yep. But um, you know she saw a lot. Do you remember what she saw that day and how's she doing? I know she saw everything. She saw flames. She saw buildings on fire. She saw everything. She's been asking questions. I know when we went to Edmonton on Mother's Day. The neighborhood there was actually on fire at the same time, so it's affected her, but uh, I, I had them fly home to Windsor, Ontario, so she can have some sort of a normalcy, so she have family to uh, rely on, talk to, kind of thing, so, but uh, we got her a puppy, so she's, she's doing well now, so <laughs> I'm hoping uh, when she gets back, we'll explain everything to her, but uh, I'm, I'm sure she'll be fine. So we're standing here for a reason. Yep. This area has definitely been hard hit on one side of the street. Yep. Um, on the other side of the street, it's fine, which is unbelievable to think about. And as we stand here and you look at this complete devastation of a vehicle behind us, and you see just how this area it came so close to the houses that are just off in the distance, you were able to go to one of these houses. What happened? Explain to me Crosley's home before we go off to that story. Well, we went to Crosley's. Uh, he's one of, a, uh, one of my friends here in Fort McMurray, a uh, really close friend. and. Through the whole process, he had no idea if his house was here or not. He's heard stories, he saw photos. There was a man going around this area with a bike, on, uh, with uh, filming his, with, with his cell phone, yeah. and he actually thought his house was gone. So in this next story, he actually comes home to see the unexpected. In some neighborhoods, this is what remains after the wildfire savagely burned through the Wood Buffalo region. 
While some residents knew the outcome of their homes, others like the Crosleys only heard stories until they returned on June 3rd. Oh my God. We thought for sure our house was gone. There was a video going around of this guy on a pedal bike come right down here at Real Martin. And, uh, and what we did was there's a bus stop out here and I actually counted back how far our house was. And it's, it's a miracle. 10 meters. That's all that separates the family's home and the devastation. Their neighbor's house still stands and although it sustained physical damage, it's been deemed unsafe. The Crosley's property, on the other hand, escaped with minor burns. What? What gave him this? Is that the side? Yeah, it did too. It scorched the side of here, huh? I think. Yeah, it did too. Look. Holy crap. I feel fortunate. I, I, I really can't explain it. Um, I know Candace said that it was like somebody put a dome around our place and it said, don't touch this family because, I mean, just look at it again. I mean, our poor, our, that's our neighbors right there, Paul, and like that could easily burn. And by the looks of it, there was like a amount of soot that there was burning ambers on our on our property, but it just didn't ignite. I mean, there's trees that, that lit up on our property, but that was it. Due to the proximity of the Crosley's house to the fire zone, they've been advised by the RMWB to have their home inspected. But for the most part, it looks like minor fixes for the family. Unfortunately, that's not the case for the rest of the residents on JW Man Drive. You got a feel for the families right here. I mean, it could easily be the whole block. So I credit the firefighters again and emergency services for the hard work they're doing. And they're still working their asses off, which is amazing. But I expected nothing less from those guys anyway. We're traveling all throughout Fort McMurray during this special and right now we're in Beacon Hill. It was one of the hardest hit areas. You can take a look around and these three trucks, well, there's barely anything left of them. There's a few chimneys standing and a few trees in the distance. But then right next to me and behind me, a house that's been saved. That's all thanks to the incredible local fire department. I had an opportunity to speak to Chief Darby Allen. Here's what he had to say. We now have the honor to be joined by Darby Allen. Darby, I can only imagine the kind of two months that you have had. And as you take a look back now, you know, you're seeing many of your residents for return back home. Can we just take a moment, though, and go back two months ago? Sure. When you see that kind of span and that kind of time that's happened, what does that mean to you of all that time that's passed? What's, what's for you some of, I guess, the, the proudest moments? Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I haven't been as directly involved as I was uh, in the first few weeks, obviously, that, that uh, direction, you know, moved to the rebuild and the recovery. And, uh, you know, Bob Couture and the team have done a fantastic job with that. But uh, in those early uh, weeks, um, we, were, we were under, you know, we being the fire department and agriculture were under a lot of pressure. And uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with what we did. You know, we, we saved the majority of the homes. Um, nobody died as a direct result. We evacuated thousands and thousands of people. So I look back on that and I, I, uh, I sleep okay with that. You know, you come back into the community and I just experienced it for the very first time and it's such a pattern this fire was sure. making, you know, and it's quite daunting for residents that are going to be returning home Certainly. seeing one item gone and then you turn and look across the street and there's something else there. Yeah. Um, as a professional, I guess, that's experienced this. Yeah. Do you have any advice to these residents? I, I just think for people coming back to town, um, most of what you see is going to look exactly the same. But you're going to drive by, as you come into town on the left, you know, the, the Super 8 isn't there anymore. And uh, Centennial Park isn't there anymore. And that's going to take a little bit of an adjustment for you. And uh, with the uh, treatment that's put on there, it's just this kind of grey white colour and it, it, looks, it looks a little bit eerie. Uh, but, you know, look at the areas that are uninvolved. Uh, as you come down that hill, you'll see beautiful downtown Fort McMurray. And uh, it's just the way you left it, apart from a couple of houses. So, um, we, we're, we're so pleased you're coming home. And uh, be positive 
Um, everybody's here and we're, we're going in the right direction and we're just, we're just waiting to welcome you home. It's been already, you spoke about how your role's already changed sure. and the rebuilding has begun in this community. You have such a huge team that you have been part of. Yes. When you look at your team right now and you guys are getting maybe an opportunity to have a little bit of a breath, yeah. is there any words that you would pass on to your team that maybe some of them, their families are now starting to come home? Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't believe any of my team left. But that's okay. But certainly some of their families may not be yet back. And I know they will have been worried about them and they'll be, you know, a little concerned of how they are. But I'm sure they've, uh, we, we changed the shift system so our guys could get out for six days at a time to go and visit with families. So I hope that they've all chance to do that. And uh, again, we welcome them back like everybody else. And, uh, you know, wives and husbands should know how tremendously we're proud of all uh, emergency workers and first responders and you know fire department staff uh, we're just so proud of what they did your husband you're a dad this is like you know this is your community when you yeah. how are you doing I'm doing great uh, my, my wife is is back now so you know we're back to normality uh, me doing the dishes, my wife cooking <laughs> wonderful meals and uh, going for nice walks by the river and, and just just kind of enjoying what we've got, you know. It's another beautiful summer in McMurray and we love uh, walking, we love the trails and uh, it's always lovely to go out because people have been so wonderful and saying hi and thank you and all those things. So uh, it's been great and um, my, my two boys are doing just fine, one's in Calgary and one's in Vancouver and uh, they're enjoying themselves. You know, you look at the community and this, for people that are watching this in different parts of Canada, you know, you think of Fort McMurray, I had the opportunity to live here, and it always has a different rep, you know, and it people does. don't really experience yeah. that type of family and energy that yeah. exists here. Just as you say goodbye to people that maybe have never been here or to some constituents that are coming home, sure. what would you say about the spirit of your community? Well, you know, I, I've talked about this quite a bit because, you know, it, I, I spend a bit of time touring around and you know you meet people and generally that McMurray has always had this bad reputation you know and uh, we don't need to get into that too much but the people know we've kind of got one of the closely guarded secrets here. We, we love our town and we love our people and we know that people come to McMurray for a reason. Sure they want to get a job and be fairly well paid for that but when they come you know, they establish themselves in the community. They start little leagues, they start card clubs, they start daycares, they start things because generally they want to make a difference. And I think we've seen that in this community prior to the fire. So it's no big surprise to me that this community reacted the way it did during the fire and post fire. You know, they're just tremendous, tremendous people. Um, they'll always have such a fond place in my heart and I, I think what this has done is shared with the rest of the province and maybe the country and maybe even internationally that, you know what, Fort McMurray is a pretty good place and we're pretty proud of it. You love it. You <laughs> betcha. Thank you so much. My pleasure. As each wave of residents returned to the city they fled just over a month ago, they've done so with a welcome from those who made this return possible. We've all been up here busting it, trying to get things ready for people to come back home. Um, so I know that the fire department was the last thing a lot of people saw as they were leaving. Uh, a lot of our trucks flying around the city, lights and sirens, and so we wanted to be one of the first things that they saw coming back. Firefighters overlooked traffic on Highway 63 as each vehicle approached Prairie Loop with honks from drivers generously beeping their horns as a sign of gratitude for the hard work these brave firefighters put in over the last 30 days. It's a beautiful thing and just, you know, you're, you're swallowing a lump in your throat as people are honking behind you and just leaning out their window and just, they're so appreciative and it's, uh, it's a, a beautiful, a beautiful thank you. It makes you feel pretty good on the inside, right? Like, you know, people get to see, you know, our hard work and people get some, not some closure, but just uh, get that good feeling coming back into town. Like so many, both Hoffman and Wagner lost their homes during the blaze. But the fact that the city still stands is a means to smile. And most important to them is that others are able to return to the region. There's a lot of people coming home and I, uh, I'm living vicariously through them right now and it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I, know. And, uh, I mean, I've had an incredible amount of people offer places to stay and, you know, like, we're taken care of and I, I have a family here with the brothers and sisters of the, with the fire department uh, and it's uh, 
it's just nice to see the city up and running again. I mean, it means so much for us to be able to, you know, try as hard as we can and, you know, fight to keep other people's homes and, you know, it's a job and we are the guys to do it. And without them, we wouldn't have homes to return to. And as long as they sit up on the overpass, we'll keep honking. It's huge community spirit. It's, it's you know, Fort McMurray Strong. It's YMM Pride. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of things. Every, every honk is, is, is that. About 50,000 people have returned to the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, and Fort McMurray is continuing to come back stronger than ever. Right now, part of that community is celebrating as they kick it off with a pancake breakfast and a smile. So we're at Shell Place um, at McDonald Island Park, and it started this morning with our pancake breakfast at 9 a.m., and it continues, and we're waiting for uh, uh, Brett Kessel to go on stage uh, to perform. And then later this afternoon at 4.45, uh, we open the gates at 4, actually. We have the uh, simulcast uh, with the concert, the Fire Aid concert that's happening at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton. So everybody in Fort McMurray can come down for free and enjoy that concert on the huge screen here at Shell Place. Welcome home. We're back, we're gonna come back stronger, bigger and better. And you know what, if you guys need any help, you know, we're all neighborly up here and uh, need a helping hand, ask your neighbor, ask a friend, they'll be there for you. It's so important because it is about raising everyone's spirits and getting everyone uh, back into the rhythm of things. And after such a tragedy, we do have to celebrate, celebrate that we've survived it and we've persevered. And, and now that uh, we have the support of not only the province, but the entire country, we have to celebrate that. It's just so nice to come home and to be back into such a great community. And what a way for Fort Mac to welcome us home by having such a great breakfast and having such a great concert later on today. So we're really thankful to the community and everybody that helped put this all together. So thank you and Fort Mac strong. It's amazing to be here and just to see everybody coming home and it's like, a celebration of we're here and we're home so it's great and it was incredibly important for the bonding and the reconnecting uh, it really made it feel, feel special and that's what today feels like Let's go. Everybody is so happy, uh, which, you know, when you go through a tragedy like this, to have a moment like this of, of normalcy is, a, is fantastic. We are once again at McDonald Island Park as Fort McMurray shows how strong they truly are. They may be rocking out for a concert, but this community is also continuing to rebuild, resilient as ever. a long time since we've been in Fort McMurray and then after the big fire happened I think it's cool that it's just we're back. Mom, okay where is your mom tonight? Lloydminster. So what has this been like for you living in Fort McMurray? It's different like it was hard to deal with the fire and all that. Fort McMurray truly does rock. Tonight the Commonwealth Place concert is being shown on the screens behind me and the people here are celebrating with pride and love as they are showing from Shell Place that they can rock out even though they've been through a time. situation for folks to be able to move forward in their community. Uh, they get together, we get to go see the bands come in, and we didn't get to go to Edmonton for this, so this is really, having a live entertainment here uh, is fantastic. It honestly allows us to move forward in our lives. It feels like normal again. I'm loving to be back into uh, the city again, so I'm really proud of Shav for being able to put on this event for us so we can come out and just be a part of our community, which we absolutely love. That's, uh, I think, the biggest focus for today and why it's so special. How are you enjoying the concert tonight? I'm telling you, it's amazing. Thank you very much. It's amazing. It's great. It's great tribute to everybody here in Fort Mac. Can we have any first responders that are here stand up and let's recognize them for the amazing work that they do for our province? 
the number of people that were coming up and hugging me and then hugging each other and just kind of welcoming each other back. It's just one big reunion. One of the highlights of tonight has been the videos showing the strength of a community that is continuing to not only rebuild, but show them that through the tears, they're going to still celebrate. Uh, I just like to see uh, a group of people like after what we've been through is it's great to see the town come together the way it was. Great baseball game tonight, and uh, hopefully the concert gets the great support as well. Makes me feel uh, welcome back. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. And, uh, you know, just look at that video. It takes you back to uh, how the whole country came together and uh, just an outpouring and, and see people here tonight enjoy themselves. And just the community come together, that's what we need. We need more celebrations and uh, you're going to bring us back to reality. We have a long road ahead of us, but uh, there's a community here that supports one another. And, uh, you know, in time, I think that uh, we'll heal and we'll rebuild and we'll restore the community that we once were. Three really strong words, we stand together. What does we stand together mean to you? throughout Fort McMurray, people are continuing to wear an orange ribbon. It's to show loss. Now this community has been through a ton, but there's no greater loss than the loss of life. And there were two lives that were lost during the evacuation. We take a moment to remember them. celebration. There's so much to be thankful for. We're now joined by Doug Roxburg, who you are a resident, not only just a reporter up here in Fort McMurray. I am. You now you think back and you guys have been through so much. There's been a two month span and it seems like a year probably. Honestly, this past two months have been just absolutely unreal. Just soaking in what happened during that day, feeding it back to everyone and then coming back weeks later and realizing, wow, there's some people that can't come back and now you're back, and it's just so many different emotions that go through your mind. I can't even explain those, what those emotions are. You know, you, you think of an entire community, and so many people have their story about how they left. You know, we already learned from Craig about how he left with his family. For yourself, walk me back. May 3rd, May 4th, when did you guys leave and what happened? So on May 3rd, we were interviewing someone downtown, actually. A piece of debris comes flying onto us downtown from the Abbasand area. Craig and I, like typical TV people, decide, let's head up to Abbasand. Let's check it out. Let's get a good visual. And we did. We got an amazing visual. The issue was, is we saw it curl over the mountain. So we get a phone call. You need to evacuate immediately from Abbasand. We get pushed downtown. We're stuck in traffic downtown. Craig goes to be with his family. I end up trying to go to a press conference that ends up being canceled. I'm now in downtown. It gets evacuated. My phone's dead. People are calling me from back home, from work, from everywhere. Which way? I'm trying to find a charger for my phone. I end up at a liquor store, line up out the door, because people are having their last request before they got to get out of the city. I end up getting pushed back to the RCMP building at Timberley. We ended up getting evacuated from there. And then from there, we ended up going south, back through the city, flames on both sides, just trying to get out. And we make our way back to Edmonton 10 hours later. 
So if you have never been to Fort McMurray before, we're in one of the most southern communities. It's definitely one of the most hard hit communities as well. What's this area that we're in right now? So this area is Beacon Hill. This is actually where the Shaw offices are. And just before we ended up going to do those interviews, this is the area that got hit first. And look around. I mean, we have friends' houses that are here and there's nothing. I mean, there's just chimney stacks. People are looking for whatever they can salvage, whether it's a wedding ring or just some sort of memory. And it's absolutely heartbreaking, especially when you know that they're probably not going to, and they have to start from scratch. And that is never, ever a good feeling. You know, throughout this process, we just had someone talk to us off camera and they were saying exactly that. They're looking for that wedding ring. They're looking for that little bit of hope to help them through this. You guys have been able to bring some hope to people by telling some of the stories. We've already seen, you know, Birchwood Trails. We've seen, we're going to go and talk a little bit more about it coming up in the show, about your interview with Mayor Blake. When you sit down with these people and you're able to tell their stories, is that helping you at all through this process? It helps, but at the same time, it, you see their heartbreak. Like, I'm interviewing some friends out of all of this, and colleagues, and people we've worked with for the last three years that I've been here. It's hard for me to ask these questions, even though I know other people need to hear these answers and to find out exactly what happened for the last two weeks, or two months, sorry. And it's hard. I, I don't know if it's helping me, but I know we need to tell these stories and tell what happened and share how great this community actually is. And as that process continues and you continue to rebuild, you know, people in this area don't really know what their future holds. But how do you see the community rebuilding? Like, what do you see? You know, I've just been here a few moments and you see a lot of spirit in people. Would you say the same thing? There's a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. And I want to say there's really no community stronger in Canada. We've talked before in the past in Fort McMurray about Fort McMurray being per capita one of the most giving communities in all of Canada. Now all of Canada is actually giving back to Fort McMurray, which is actually nice to see. But it's the strength because everyone in this town is from somewhere else. So you come here and very few people are originally from Fort McMurray. So you have to find a sense of community somewhere and people will bring you in and help you out. And that's what's happening now. And that's what has to happen in the future. It's going, to be an, it's going to be a long process. This isn't going to be easy. A lot of people need help and they need help now, but people also have to be patient and it's gonna to be tough going forward. You know, there's so many stories. This next one we have for you is an incredible story. Walk us through what we're about to see with the helicopters. The visuals are absolutely astounding from the past two months here in Fort McMurray with the wildfires and you're going to see some footage that I was able to obtain from Phoenix Hell Flight because they were the eyes in the sky but they were also there to help people when they needed it most and especially those at the Northern Lights Health Center. You know it's really amazing you know they talk about Fort Mac strong and really the strength of each individual came out at that time. The time in question was the day of the evacuation from the wildfires. The individuals were the helicopter pilots, doctors, and nurses. The situation was getting dire as people were fleeing the city. As you know, we've been calling this fire the beast, and um, I had no idea how large a forest fire could get until I saw a fire of this magnitude. And as the smoke kind of got bigger and bigger and closer, then it started to really get real. And then that's when I guess started kicking in that, okay, I think we might have a problem, I guess. It was real all right. The flames began to curl over the mountains near Abbasand and made their way to Beacon Hill. So the hospital staff began getting patients to safety as quickly as possible. Most patients could be transported by the highways, but there was one patient who required immediate care in the intensive care unit. They had to be transported by air to the nearest facility, so with some quick thinking, Katie Kirshner called the Local Helicopter Emergency Response Organization, HERO for short, for a big time favor. We got a call, um, I forget the exact time, it was in the afternoon I believe. Roughly about 2 o'clock I believe it was, from the IC unit at uh, Northern Lights Regional that some of the patients in the hospital couldn't be taken out by road and uh, we knew that it was about to be evacuated so we were asked to come and see if we could bring some of them out. 
So the other patients could drive out, but there was one that we knew needed medical attention and needed it sooner than later. So we had to get um, that patient out as fast as we could and as safely as we could. The first thoughts of my mind actually on the, on the phone call request, I said, um, I, I think it would be best to get this patient sooner than later. Based on the conditions of the wildfire, the assumption from Ken Duick was correct. This phone conversation was the easy part, as the challenging part was mere minutes away. First, they had to navigate the blackened skies from Phoenix Heliflate to the hospital, and then they had to find a landing spot, because the Northern Lights Regional Health Center does not have a landing pad. Uh, first of all, we had to deal with all the smoke and fire, so we had to kind of fly fairly low uh, to get under, under everything. And we were just uh, picking our way through um, as we went down the Clearwater Valley towards waterways and then uh, eventually towards the hospital. Um, we landed in the, the field adjacent to it. And uh, it was really surreal to just see this huge machine landing in a field where it should not be. And we couldn't get the patient through the gate that had access to the field. So that was frustrating. So then um, one of the helicopter pilots realized, hey, I think we have enough room in the parking lot to actually land. We had to um, reposition the aircraft over into the parking lot, you know, not an ideal s setting to land the helicopter. So we had to clear out some cars in the parking lot to make enough space to bring the aircraft in so that the patient could be wheeled uh, directly into the aircraft and then flown from there. With no landing pad, if it wasn't for the quick thinking of the pilots, who knows what could have happened to the intensive care patient. The actions taken by not only the pilots, but the doctors and nurses helped save a life that day. They don't want to be referred as heroes, though, as they are just part of a program that is designed for this type of situation. Our program here is actually called the Local Hero Foundation, which stands for Helicopter Emergency uh, Response Operations. So that's basically what I think of when I, when I think of hero. I'm glad the program exists um, so that we're here on, at, at the right time, at the right place to be able to, you know, do what we can in, in, in that kind of an emergency. The fact that we have um, the helicopters that are able to come and assist us, especially just being so rural, that um, it's phenomenal. For people that lost everything in the blaze, being able to go through all their items and find maybe something that reminds them of home has helped them. Here we have an old computer and even a little ceramic cat. Whatever it was, it's bringing them a little bit of peace of mind as they go through this tragedy. In this next story, we meet a family and what they found is bringing them hope. <laughs> Father's Day is the time you spend with your dad, but this was no ordinary Father's Day, at least not for Travis Wood and his father, as they did something they've never done before, sifting through the remains of what was once the Woods' home. We went in with my, uh, my dad and uh, our friends, and we made the boxes for sniffing through it, and yeah, we came up with uh, the wedding ring and uh, a couple other rings. Travis and his wife Kayla lost their home in Timberlee to the wildfire that consumed 25% of Fort McMurray. Everything they owned lost in the blaze. Not knowing what may have survived the fire, the family just wanted to see if anything was salvageable, but thought the window to sift was quickly closing. It was a long process. We were already uh, stressed about uh, everything else going on. And um, I got a hold of the city and they put me towards uh, the number for Rubicon, basically. And uh, I left them a voicemail. My parents left them a voicemail. I'm sure they were very busy at the time and they never got back to me. We felt almost r panicked with time. We thought, oh no, the city's going to not let us in. It's not going to, we're going to not be able to go through it at all. And finally, we kind of just got fed up and I picked a weekend to come up to Fort McMurray and basically look through the rubble myself. Travis's persistence paid off. On the first day, he found his wife's wedding ring. But it was the hour of searching on Father's Day that the husband would literally strike gold. When he went back, very quickly he found my engagement ring, my uncle's ring, and everything else. While she was happy to see the rings the couple exchanged on their wedding day, it was the ring that belonged to her uncle that seemed to mean the most, a ring she never took off. He passed away there years ago before uh, we knew each other, and they were just very close, and that ring meant, meant a lot to her. He is not much older than me, and so we grew up more like siblings. And um, when he passed away, our daughter's named after him, so it was pretty important. That's all I have left of him. 
What is this one made out of again? Tungsten? Tungsten. Unfortunately, the Woods Insurance only covers partial payment on a new home. Everything they've purchased in the past is now gone. But the symbols which represent their unconditional love for one another still remains, as well as the last possessions of her late uncle, turning the perspective of this devastating fire into an optimistic outlook. I think we heard that insurance wasn't going to come through, and then it was only a week later he found the rings. So it completely just changed how we view the situation, because now we have a little bit of positivity. Since this evacuation, so many people have stepped up to help, not only with the evacuation, but with the rebuild of our beautiful community. Well, in this next story, we meet a 14-year-old girl who wanted to help during the evacuation, but she was told no. Now, we're going to learn in this next story that you never tell a teenager no, because they're going to do it anyway. 14-year-old Caitlin Lapine wanted to prove that age is just a number. As an avid animal lover and equestrian, Lapine wanted to take part in the pet rescue efforts, but was told she was too young. The teenager wouldn't take no for an answer, so she thought of another way she could help that was close to her heart. I thought maybe I could plant trees for all the areas that lost the trees, especially because I ride horses a lot. And down on Tower Road, we lost all the trees in the trails. And that's really what started the idea for the trees, is after I saw it, the trails were completely destroyed. And I went on them every day, and they were beautiful and green. I wanted to get it replanted and get Fort McMurray green again. Her initial idea was to assemble a group of teenagers under the age of 18 to assist in planting 200 saplings in areas where large amounts of trees were lost during the wildfire. But an email to a company in Prince Edward Island sparked something bigger than her and her mother initially expected. She started a GoFundMe page and then she reached out to Vessies in uh, PEI and Vessies sent her an email saying we have some trees that we could send you, give us an address. She gave them the address of the ranch that we were staying at and they sent an email saying we've shipped $13,000 worth of trees to you. When I read the email, like I was shocked. I didn't think they were actually going to be able to send many trees because they were just going to talk to their manager and see if they were able to, but they sent all their out-of-season stock. The number of trees was too much for her and her friends to plant, so the Lapine family decided to give the trees away to McMurrayites to plant themselves, something Ray Frazier, one of the recipients of the trees, thought was a great initiative for someone so young. I think it was a good thing put out by the kids that wanted to uh, participate in helping out, but weren't old enough. And uh, kind of a good, good idea by them. Kind of memorial trees if we get them to grow. <laughs> the forest will grow by itself, but when you're planting trees, it's you're basically symbolizing the rebuild. When Lapine returns to the Wood Buffalo region, she plans on continuing that momentum by replanting white birch trees along the trails on Tower Road. As we're continuing to tour the city, we're now joined by the president of the Canadian Red Cross. Now, so much has been raised for the community. What have you been able to accomplish so far? Well, I think, first of all, you're right. A tremendous response from all of Canadians. Over one million Canadians donated uh, to, the, to help the evacuees at Port McMurray. Uh, $136 million raised to date, but more to come. This is without the matching fund. The Red Cross has been involved uh, in an important way, of course, in giving support to, to everybody that's been evacuated through the registration and through financial, direct financial assistance. I think the important thing is now we're, we're in Fort McMurray. Uh, we're going to be here for the long run and uh, we'll be uh, meeting as we go forward uh, more specific needs, needs that are not met by existing programs. And what we ask people is, is those that, that have those needs, come and see us. We're going to be here. Um, don't worry, we're getting a lot of questions. We're, we're not ending our programs. We're not ending our support programs. We're going to be here for a long time. And unfortunately, some people will have needs uh, in the weeks, in the months, and then maybe in the years to come. So we will be here. You've done so much already. We've been able to see the flights and other right. programs that have existed. Right now, people are watching this and they're just returning home for the very first time. What would you say to them? Well, I, th I think again, um, you know, if you have some unmet needs, um, you know, for whatever reason that are fairly specific, don't worry, come and meet us and we'll deal with those confidentially and, and separately. So, so we're, that's why we're there. So we've opened up an office on Hardening Street. Uh, you can find us there. Don't hesitate. Uh, we're there to provide support. We're helping in this transition. And again, people's needs are different. Uh, you know, some will be fine, which is great and others uh, for different circumstances might need some additional assistance. So, so don't hesitate and come and see us. We 
already had an opportunity to speak to Mayor Melissa Blake earlier on in the show, and now we finish that interview with Doug Roxburgh. It's incredible to see how much she has gone through, not only as a community leader, but also as a mother, as her community continues to rebuild. Have you grown from this experience? Have you learned a lot? Because this is a fire that was unexpected. It's something that, how do you prepare for it? You know, in terms of preparation, we have plans. They're written down, and if certain things happen certain ways, they make sense. But when everything goes upside down as quickly as it did, those plans quickly uh, need to be not rewritten, but certainly reinvented. And that's what was going on, I think, through the course of, of the events that we we're experiencing. And I guess what I would say about learnings are that the things that we've been pursuing in our region for a long time, um, you know, it started with the necessity of twinning 63, and thank God we had as much of that completed at the time of evacuation as we did. But we've long said that we need to have an an alternate route, and the alternate route was if you ever had, um, you know, a dangerous goods incident or, or debilitating traffic accident, you'd have no other way really to cross that river. And when we got our third bridge, it, it's been great. Don't get me wrong, but it's still in the same location, which in a situation like that fire does not help one bit when you've got 20,000 people who evacuated north and you've got that fire looming closer day after day. And so, I still say that the things that we were passionately pursuing before need to be continuously advocated for and delivered. Frankly, delivery would have made a difference like you wouldn't believe. What is Fort McMurray going to look like in the next five to ten years? Is it going to be the same? Uh, it's not the same. It's not the same right now and it won't be the same in the future and I think that's part of the the wonderful thing that can happen. We've had this horrific setback and because of the mindset I think of most people, that strength, that resilience, uh, we're going to be able to reimagine what we should be. We had a reconciliation with the economy. Obviously we'd been experiencing a lower for longer oil price and we were already starting a bit of a reset but I think at the other end um, we as a, a community with the spirit that was here before are only going to find that amplified. Uh, we've got difficult days ahead and we're going to have some anger and, and disillusionment and people that will lose their businesses, people that will not be able to recover, people who will choose not to come back. But the people that are here, they will continue to grow stronger and stronger and they will be better and better for the pursuits that we take on. I think we've opened not only, not only our minds but our hearts to what we receive for care and compassion throughout this nation as we took our refuge. I really think that they will see that payback tenfold and we were already pretty good at, at giving before. I think we're going to be even better now. So I guess we have to preach patience because it is going to be difficult going forward. <sighs> Well, when I ran for office the first time, I learned you've got to be really patient. <laughs> and so I'm trained at patience, but you're right. People people really have that, that desire to see things happen quickly, and we want to be as quick as we can, but there are really some significant things that have to be overcome before we can get to that end point. Anything else you want to add? Uh, anything you want to say to the citizens of Fort McMurray? I will say that you are the most incredible citizens. When we looked at that uh, day of darkness descend upon us and I saw how you went through that day, you and every other person who stayed behind will always have my ultimate respect and whether you choose to make this your home every day in the future or if you find you have to take your leave, you will always have that, that heartfelt appreciation for how you handled yourself that day and the days past. Madam Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate thank you. it. Thank you so much for joining us for the past hour as we were able to show you how strong Fort McMurray really is. This community is unbelievably thankful to the first responders, to the work that they have done, and they are prepared to rebuild. The concert tonight just showed that when they can come together, amazing things can happen. We leave you now with a video where they took time to say thank you and to prove how strong they really are.
This is about the hundreds and hundreds of people who came here and helped us and supported us. Those people that lived here that supported us did incredible work. I just want to say thank you to the first responders, everybody in Fort McMurray, um, Connie, Wyatt, Cindy Davis for taking me in. Um, love you guys. Good to be back. I would like to thank all of the first responders and everybody else who helped get everybody out of Fort McMurray alive. I'm scared to think about what would have been left of the town had they not been here working so hard. To thank you to everyone who's contributed in any way, even the smallest thing, even by giving us a hug, it's, it's truly incredible. So thank you to everybody. It's beyond worth how much we appreciate everything that you're doing for us. We have so much love in our heart for everyone that opened their hearts to us and, and made us feel welcome through this disaster, and we're so happy to be home. The people that put us up in Edmonton and uh, their family, we very much appreciate it. Uh, you saved me, my wife, and my beautiful dog. And especially to Drayton Valley for, um, for being my home for the past month. And to everyone here, welcome back. I'm just so grateful to everyone in the community. We've been amazing. We'd like to thank Wood Buffalo for all the support and generosity we've received. And we wish everyone well and an excellent re-entry. To the Lee's family in Edmonton, I was a complete stranger to them, but they wholeheartedly offered their house so I can have a place to stay. And thank you as well for making me feel like a member of the family. And for that, I will be forever thankful. Big thanks to the staff at the Mark Amy Treatment Center for giving me a place to sleep on that first night. These are kindnesses that I'll never forget. Thank you all the RCMP and the firefighters that were fighting to try to keep safe our community. I just want to say my thanks to all the local firefighters that put their heart and soul in keeping us protected. In particular, one of my good friends, Scott Germain, who unfortunately lost his house. He wasn't the only one. Zach, I know you're out there too and you lost yours. Mark, I was thinking about you guys every day and we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you guys. I'd like to thank the Fort McMurray Fire Department. The firefighters. The firefighters. Fire Department. Thank you to the firefighters. I'd just like to thank uh, all the firefighters and the first responders. Great job, guys. Thank you to all the firefighters. To all the firefighters. We would just like to give a special thank you to all the members of the Anzac Fire Department. Good job, guys. It's a sense of community. It's a sense of pride. We're still fighting together. We will be back. We will build, and we will be strong. through the sadness and everything of what's going on, the people are bouncing back and, the, and everybody's happy and Fort Mac is, is back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It feels great to be back. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Glad to be back home. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, Canada. Thank you. From everyone here in Fort McMurray, just thank you. Mm -hmm.